I want to introduce our guest preacher this morning, Reverend Deborah Northern. She is a member of the Committee on Ministry in the Hudson River Presbytery, and her reputation as a good preacher precedes her. Please join me with our call to worship. With patience and love, we come as one family. Come, speak of truth, truth told in love. We are God's children, part of Christ's purpose. Come, now is the time for worship. Our hymn 483. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, this is the day you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, God, for gathering us here in this space, in this holy space. We ask, Lord, that you would be present with us. Guide us, instruct us, lead us. Open our hearts and our minds to new insights and understanding, and lead us in your path. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.
Please join me in the call to confession. Have mercy on us, O God of love and grace. Wash away the thoughts that bind us to sin and raise those actions that lead us away from you. Fill us with the joy you offer through the grace of Jesus Christ. Grant us clean hearts and willing minds that we may walk in your ways and rejoice in your truth. Strengthen us with living plans and righteous deeds that we may offer your justice and mercy to a world in need. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. Won't you rise or greet your neighbor with signs of peace? The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Bless you. Our Old Testament reading this morning is the 23rd Psalm, which is on page 501 in your pew Bible, if you want to follow along. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters and restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. You are with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Guys, come on over here. We got children's time. For yeah, all right. Come on down on the stairs. Yeah. I know. I, I always look, I look forward to, the, uh, to Sunday school, too. I, I, one of my favorite things when I was your guys' age was running down the stairs to Sunday school. That was my favorite thing of all time. Do you guys run down the stairs? You walk down the stairs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Yeah, you jump that? Yeah, I... I Next time, jump it with a half twist. See what you got. No, I'm just kidding. That's just, no, just kidding. Just kidding. Not trying to get crazy here. But, but let's, ret- let's arrive safely. That's important too. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good? Well, we're going to learn today um, about a story uh, from, from the Bible um, that actually has to do a lot with that banner up there right behind Pastor Deborah. You guys see this over here? If you look behind, you see, we see the banner over there in the far corner. What? Yeah, what's happening in that? What's happening on that banner? Yeah. Wait, hold on a second. What do you see? A a net around the cross that's catch, catching all the fish. Catching fish. Does anybody see anything else? Beautiful. What else? Anything else? A boat. There's a boat, right? Lots of water. We got lots of things. So my first question to you all is, uh, what does it take to go fishing? You ever been fishing before? 
Okay, well, hold on a second. Let me make sure everyone can hear you. A fishing pole, a tent, and a campfire, and some fish. Go fishing. This man is prepared. What else? What else? What else might you need? He was doing camping. Oh, camping and fishing. You got, you got the double whammy. Anything else, guys, you need when you go fishing? Can you think of anything else? No? Well, let me, let me, let me, let me, whoa, whoa. You got, you got the items. We need the equipment. We need the gear. But I'm also curious to know, what other characteristics might you need to prepare yourself inside when you go fishing? Because is it a guarantee that those fish are going to bite on that hook? What else might you need inside? What else might you need before you go fishing? What might you need? Worms. Worms. Oh, worms. We also need worms. Yes. Important, important element. What else might you need, though, in order to prepare yourself for, like, the experience? What else might you need? A net. Ooh, a net as well? All right. I'm going for the deeper level. Maybe we'll get there in a little bit. You would need a net. Okay. So you guys are pretty good at this. Ah, now we're talking. We need patience. Beautiful. On that, on that note, is there anything else we might need when we go fishing? Like when you're out on the water or anything? Can it sometimes be scary on that boat, maybe? Yeah? yeah? So what else might you need? You need stairs to go down the... Uh... <laughs> if you're going away from land, you'll prob you probably need uh, survival stuff. Okay, survival stuff, right? So we need a lot of things when we go fishing. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to go fishing in the way that Jesus' day was able to do it. Now, you talked about rods and reels and hooks and things. We're going to go fishing, though, the way how Jesus, the folks, when they were back in Jesus' time, yeah, we're going to throw out a net. Ha-ha. Now, I went to the local fishing store, guys. I got to tell you, they don't really sell nets anymore. I'm sorry, but we, we have the new age fishing. However, today, we're going to pretend that this blanket represents our net. And we're going to pretend that this, this is perfect. This giant blue carpet is the... The water, the sea, maybe there's some fish in this ocean. We're going to make believe a little bit, okay? You're going to be, well, we're going to see if there's any fish in the, in, the, in the ocean, okay? So I need you guys, you're going to work together. I need you to take the net and spread it all the way out. Everybody stand up, grab a corner, everybody gra help out. Help out, grab a corner of the net, everybody help out. Spread it all out, it's got to be nice and smooth. Everybody grab one corner. We need some help on this bottom corner. Ah, beautiful. Nice. This is actually a special net. Can anybody see what's on the bottom corner here on this net? Yeah, <laughs> it's a Presbyterian symbol here. Okay, so, all right, everybody, we're going to shift down to the main floor. Come take a step down from the stairs. And on the count of three, we're going to, like, cast our net. We're going to gently toss the net towards the, towards the pews. Are you ready? Count to three. Ready? Everybody help out. We're going to count down from three. Three, two, one. Ready? Three, two, one. Cast that net. All right. Pretty good. Cast. We Cast, not bad. Guys, check the net. Did you get any fish? Well, time out. Did we, did we wait long enough? Did we wait long enough? No. Okay, let's leave the net down on, on the floor here for a little bit longer. You guys come back and take a, step on the, uh, take a seat on the steps here. Leave the net down there. We'll see if we get any fish. Okay, beautiful. So while we're waiting for maybe some fish in this net, let's talk about what happened in Jesus' time. Now, this is a story from Mark. We're not going to hear the passage. So in the story from Mark, that's one of the, Bi one of the stories in the Bible, Jesus was looking to recruit some folks, and he was walking along, and he decided to go down by the water, by the docks, because a lot of people back then were fishermen. That's how they got food. You need to feed your family, right? And so he went down by the docks, and he saw some people fishing, and so he was like, oh, maybe these guys would be up for following me and learning a little bit more about what I have to share. He recruited two brothers who were fishing, and he said, you guys are fishing for fish, right? You're doing a great job. They looked pretty good. They had some skills. They had some patience as well. They had some skill with the net. Maybe they had some perseverance, but they also were taking care of each other. He said, okay, you guys look like pretty good candidates here. And you know what he said to them? He said, you know, I got something for you guys. You are fishing for fish right now, but if you come and follow me and learn what I have to teach you, I will make you fishers of people. What? the heck does that mean? Fishers of people, are we casting out a net to try to catch people? Is that what Jesus meant by that? No. no. But what he was truly meaning is that sometimes as followers of Christ and of people who believe in God, we need to cast out our net, and our net is sometimes 
showing kindness, tossing out our heart first to try to do right by people and try to do kind things. Maybe it's forgiving somebody. Maybe it's forgiving ourselves. Maybe it's going up to somebody and letting them know that you see them and you want to extend your peace to them. It can look lots of different ways. And in that way, we are casting out our hearts, casting a wide net, people we know, people we don't know. And that's what it means to be a fisher of people. Do you think you guys could potentially be up for being a fisher of people in following Christ? Right? Is that, that's not impossible. It's not too hard, right? Was it hard to throw out this net? No, right? We can cast this out any time. And here's the best part. Jesus wants to cast his net out that we may be caught in his net so he can continue to bring us in so we can be closer to him as well. So there's lots of stories here. Guys, you want to try fishing one more time before we, before we call it? Okay, we're going to try a bigger net, though. Leave this one on the floor. We're going to try a bigger net. So hold on. Let's help out. Hold on a second here. Everybody's going to grab a corner. You want to keep this one face down here. Okay, everybody grab, grab a corner. Grab a corner. All right, guys. So we're going to cast this net. On the count of three, we're going to cast the net. You just let it drop on the floor. Ready? One, two, three. So we go. Okay, wait. Let's exercise some patience, some love, some persistence, some trying to be kind to people. Can you guys open the net and see if we've got anything underneath? Oh, show everybody in the pews. One, two, three, four, <laughs> show people in the pews. Guys, Rory, come around to this side. What did we get in there? Look at this, with some love and with some kindness and with some, yeah, round of applause. Look at this, we got some fish, right? Beautiful. Okay, guys, nice job. Come back down the stairs one more time. We're going to close in prayer. Yeah, well, I know Skylar might have been up to some trickiness before we, uh, you know, started. That's okay. You, you found me out. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Okay, dear Lord, as we come to you on this glorious, beautiful Sunday morning, we pray that we can listen to this story and remind ourselves of this incredible invitation to follow you and to be a fisher of people. Lord, we pray that we can take this, this story and internalize it in our hearts this week as we go out about our, our routines, our chores, our being brothers and sisters, our being mothers and fathers. Lord, we pray that we can do these things and think about how we are casting out our hearts. We think about how we can cast out our kindness. We think about how we can cast out our love in ways, simple things, through our words and our actions that we may love others in this big way. And Lord, and sometimes we try to avoid your net. We pray that we can get caught up in your net and in your plan that you have for us this week as well. In your name we say, amen. Please walk. Please walk. All right. The scripture lesson is taken from 1 John 3.16 through 24. Hear now these words. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. But whoever has worldly goods and sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are the truth and will set our heart at ease before him, that if our heart condemns us, that God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments remains in him, and he in him. We know by this that he remains in us by the spirit whom he has given us. This is the word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. Won't you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, may the words of my mouth and the collective meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I recently received a phone call from a young man who at the tender age of 26 is struggling with anxiety, depression, substance use, and all the stressors of coping with the traumas of his childhood. When he called me a few days ago, he immediately offered an apology for calling while he was in this state of hopelessness and fatigue. Our previous interactions and his words have informed me that he feels comfortable or comforted in speaking with me. So needless to say, I told him he need not apologize. I was sincerely grateful to hear his voice for the first time in two months, wondering how he was doing since we last spoke. As he began to talk about his current challenges, he described being tired. Tired of feeling anxious, tired of feeling fearful, tired of being unhappy, tired of struggling. He said he spends upwards of $500 a week for the care he receives from his therapist and the psychiatrist. He has a few different prescribed medications he's taking, and he's tired of those two. Explaining that he has been struggling along on this journey for years. And he wonders where God is and whether or not God cares. Once there was the safety assessment, the conversation moved to gentle reminders of God's presence. You see, whatever the details of his childhood traumas, he can now look back, name it, and by God's grace, use the past tense. He is no longer where he used to be. By the grace and mercy of God, he made it through. And while there is post-trauma or post-traumatic stressors that are often intrusive memories or flashbacks that create intense emotional or physical reactions, he has actually been able to experience some post-traumatic gifts and growth. Out of the depths of pain, suffering, and trauma, something within has created a deeper sense of compassion, a heightened sensitivity, a profound insight, and a deeper wisdom about self and others, a knowledge about God and God's presence, particularly in times of challenge. You see, when you come through those storms and you look back and you wonder how you made it through, you realize, like the one set of footprints in the sand, it was the love of God that carried you through. <coughs> For this young man, he is, in, he is the first in his family to attend college graduated with honors, then continued on to an Ivy League graduate school. And then he landed on Wall Street, earning enough money to now support his parents. 
He recognizes that it is the grace and the love of Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in, in whom he lives and moves and has his being. Our prescription and guide for living a life worthy of calling ourselves the people of God is in the example of Christ. We show up in church, I believe, because we're seeking meaning, purpose, and understanding about the Christian faith, who God is, who are we in relationship to God, how do we live out this life as a Christian, a follower of Christ? What is eternal life and how do we achieve it? How do we live a life that is worthy and acceptable in the sight of God? How do we know that there is a God, especially when there's so much suffering? There are countless people in our midst suffering with daily messages that their lives don't matter. Too often there are messages to suggest that I am less than, that my life doesn't matter because of the way I look or the way I think or the way I show up in the world. For countless people, there are no life-affirming messages and they are left to wonder where is this God that never leaves us or forsakes us? In conversation with an older adult I have journeyed alongside with for a number of years, she explained to me, my landlord has been taking my money for years. What was to be an exchange for a habitable apartment with heat and hot water. Instead, I have holes in my walls. Rodents, the apartment is freezing in the winter and scorching hot in the summer. And I still have to pay my rent, whether the landlord fulfills their end of the agreement or not. Where is the justice? Sure, there are housing advocates and housing courts, multiple building violations and fines imposed. There are lawyers and judges, but somehow the landlord always wins. I can't risk becoming homeless. I feel powerless, she says. Unfortunately, this one person represents too many residents living in overcrowded cities where there is a dearth of affordable homes. There are people praying, P-R-E-Y-N-G, on some of the most vulnerable. The fears and the struggles against powers and structures and systems are too much for the average person to combat, especially when you've grown weary along this uphill battle. And if you factor in pre-existing challenges for those who have chronic diseases and debilitating illnesses and who are fighting just to survive, these challenges and struggles are the reality of life for too many. I have a dear friend who, along with her spouse, became parents through transracial adoption. One of their two children is struggling with anxiety and phobias that have often resulted in isolation and deprivation of engaging programs and activities that her parents feel are age appropriate and enriching for her life. My friends are amazing parents who are keenly attuned to the needs of both their children and they work diligently to, to stay 10 steps ahead of their girls who have not yet reached adolescence. The oldest child who has been working through her fears and anxiety recently confronted her mother by questioning her as to why she had not informed her of a mass shooting. For all of my friends' efforts to, to manage the news content 
and reassure her child of safety. She couldn't shield her from the current events discussion that took place in her class at school. This sweet, bright, and innocent child finds comfort in her home with her parents and family. She is less inclined to engage in the activities that are more public. A beautiful child, not yet 18, finds the world overwhelming fright and frightening, not only for her, but for her sister, who is of Chinese descent, two bright young girls whose parents and family have instilled in them that they can do whatever they decide they want to do with their lives, even beyond their fears. I say to my little friend, you are correct. The world is a very scary place, but we have a prescription for living and for living well. Living well doesn't mean we live in fear to the point where we can't use our God-given gifts freely in the world. We counter our fear with trust in the one who loves us beyond imagining. We trust that if there are, if there are enough believers and followers of Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, The love that they know through Jesus can cast out those debilitating fears and lead us to live freely and securely in the confidence that God is indeed with us. It is a frightening world, but we come to church to grow in our faith and to strengthen our relationship and understanding of a God who has been our dwelling place in all generations. We come to church knowing that we need help and we need guidance and we need to be fueled with the love of Christ who set for us an example, provided us with a prescription for how we are to live our lives in pursuit of justice, peace, harmony, joy. The church is uniquely positioned to address the fears and counter the hate. How we live our lives has the potential to make a difference in shaping or reshaping events locally, nationally, globally. Part of the arrogance of human nature is to think that we know more than others do, which is why in the first epistle of John, the apostle John addresses the problem of false teachers who were making claims about their knowledge regarding the deity and the nature of Christ. John counters their false claims by reminding his readers of the eyewitness accounts of the apostles, including himself. Jesus Christ came in human flesh, lived a human life, died, and then was raised from the dead. He was fully human and fully divine. Anything else being taught by others was false. In this epistle, John sounded an alarm on false teaching, which could not be tolerated. Falsehoods would lead to immortality, and immortality would lead to eternal death. In contrast, the truth would demonstrate itself in love and love would lead to eternal life. For John, what one believed truly mattered. A person's behavior was a result of that person's belief. The manner in which we treat people, good or bad, is in direct correlation with what we believe about them. Love of neighbor, love of self, and obedience to God's commands is the formula for a healthy relationship with God. The text indicates that murder and hate take life, but love gives life, and Jesus is the supreme example of this. Christ's example is not only to be admired, it is to be duplicated. The scripture states, whoever says I abide in Christ should walk just as Christ walked. 
Jesus' love is expressed through self-sacrifice, not simply words. Actions, as we know, speak much louder than words, and all the promises and pronouncements that we might make. In our text, John states the need to love others like we love ourselves. It is one of the great commandments, or known as the Shema. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But John goes a step further in urging us to love others more than we love ourselves. In other words, we are to be willing to give our lives for others, even as Christ gave his life for us. Scholars say the term goods in this text means course of life, living, or livelihood. This same Greek word is translated life. It refers to the material objects that sustain life. Therefore, the need that is mentioned is for food, for clothing, for shelter. In other words, what we followers of Christ or strivers in this faith willing to sacrifice in order to sustain the life of another. John is using a rhetorical question to help us understand that self-sacrificial love can also mean sharing material goods that help provide security and the basic subsistence for life for another. If one claims love for another in Christ, but the actions deny or betray that love, does the love of God abide in them? Is that a Christian, the text asks. Love is understood to be an action and is said to be revealed by its fruits. Is, is this what we believe? While there may be various reasons why we show up in church, there should be at least one common reason for our presence and membership within the body of Christ. We are answering the call to follow Christ and to love has everything to do with that call, our lives, our beliefs, and our actions. These times are challenging beyond our imagining but the good news, my friends, is we have a prescription for living and for living well. We are equipped. We are equipped to face the challenges. We are equipped with the love that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We are equipped to take that love and use it to transform not only our communities, but to help transform the nation the world, to create a better, healthier world for generations to come. May it be so. Amen. Friends, won't you join me in prayer for our community, people, for the church. Gracious and loving God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through your son, Jesus. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred that infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us, unite us in bonds of love, and through our struggle and confusion, Work to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Continue to bless this congregation as they heal from hurt, wounds, or loss. Bless their wonderful works and continue to inspire them in their words, but especially in their acts and deeds. 
Lord, you know our every need, our every want and desire before we can utter a word. We ask that you meet every one of us in our unique areas of need and grant unto us your favor. Hear this prayer and the perfect prayer Jesus taught us to say together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the Lord has granted us the gift of newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is my hope and my prayer that in the days ahead, you go forward renewed by God's love and peace and grace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet commitment of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each of you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>